Okay, let's pray together <clears throat> and repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to speak to my life, that you'd minister to my heart. I pray your word would be revealed to me today in a way that I understand it, so that I can speak it, so that I can do it, and so that I can see it change my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we, we started last week looking at live by God's divine power, and it's based on Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think so soberly as God has dealt with each one a measure of faith. So we each have a measure of faith. We went through the story of the Apostle Paul last week, and uh, what the Apostle Paul teaches us is that a genuine encounter with Jesus will radically transform people's lives. Amen? And that's why I want to encourage you to make sure, if you haven't been to the life class, start coming on Thursday. All right? Because it's only when we have a radical encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ that our lives will change. And here's the reality. God's not going to pressure you to change. God invites you to change. God says to you, I've done everything that you need. The blood of my son was shed for you. And now I'm inviting you to receive that so that you may change. And then Paul said to Timothy, his son, 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, All these things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so what the apostle Paul actually was saying was, Timothy, since the day I gave my life to Jesus, I've been out there preaching the gospel. I've been out there letting people know that the gospel is the way, that the blood of Jesus can set you free from all of your sin, from every curse. And now, these things that you've heard me teach in the presence of many witnesses, I want you to take that out there, and I want you to go to the people of the world, and I want you to teach them, and then I want you to teach this, these truths to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And this is the vision of God for the church. But Jesus also let us know in John 15 verse 5, he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. God has called you to produce the fruit of the gospel. And what is the fruit of the gospel? There's two aspects of the fruit of the gospel. It's the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of disciples. That is what God has called each and every one of us to. But then we've got to be careful not to listen to the lies of the adversary. And if we listen to the lies of the adversary, then there's a whole lot of trouble. Because he distorts our image. Our image was destroyed when Adam sinned. It makes us be in a position where we think of ourselves less than what we should think of ourselves, taking into account the blood of Jesus. I want you to realize, with the blood of Jesus, you have everything that you need to live a life where you experience the righteousness of, of the Lord that comes through Jesus Christ, where you experience the overcoming of sin by the blood of Jesus, where you begin to reclaim the image that the enemy stole from you, the image that God has for you, and not to look at yourself in terms of the shape of your nose or the size of your ears or the color of your skin or what kind of hair you got or how, how little hair you got or how gray your hair is or what, whatever things people worry about. The Lord has come and Jesus lost his identity so that you can reclaim the image that God has for you. If you didn't share last week's sermon or if you forgot it, I'm going to encourage you to go and watch it. You can catch it on the Active Worship channel or on Active TV. But I want us to take this thing further that Jesus said he expects his disciples to produce the fruit of the kingdom, to produce the fruit of the gospel. And when Christians don't do this, and this is our message today, when Christians do not take up their responsibility, 
the world suffers. And I want you to think about the world right now. The world is a broken place. A few weeks ago, we had a tragedy at a place called the Enyo Beni Tavern. And uh, that was in the Eastern Cape. 21 young children and an adult died in that establishment on that night. Today, we're still not sure what killed them. The place was packed. People were celebrating finishing their mid-year exams, you know. Maybe celebrate at the end of the year, you know what I'm saying. Don't celebrate midgets. You're only halfway. Yay, we're halfway. Let's stop. Let's have a party. Let's drink. Let's get drunk. Let's go absolutely paralytic. Amen? That's like the sports team that gets halfway through the season. And halfway in the season, they're in the playoff positions. You know what I'm saying? And now they go and they get paralytically drunk and, and, they, and they go and they celebrate what's going to happen the second half of the season. They ain't winning nothing. But this area near East London was absolutely devastated when 21 of their young kids died and some of their parents thought that their children were sleeping over at friends. I want you to think about that community today. You see, that community where this tavern was, now, I mean, everyone's shouting about the tavern. We all know why they're shouting about that one tavern. We all know that that's a joke. We all know that taverns are happening, every, taverns happened last night in our area. We know this. But yet we blame those police there in that place, those parents, the owners of that tavern. When we know how we were complaining, when they said no alcohol during the lockdown. And you know what this comes from? The world's brokenness comes from a world that does not know Romans 12, 3, and I want to read it to you again. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each the measure of faith. And what the Apostle Paul discovered, he discovered the grace of God when he, when he had the encounter with Jesus. And he was the first recipient of the love of God in a supernatural way, other than those that had heard from Jesus directly. But I want you to think about this grace. And the question I want to ask you today is, what was this grace? And I want you to think about the sin that God had forgiven Paul for. When Paul was Saul, he was attacking the church. He was persecuting the church. He was throwing Christians in jail. He was approving of Christians being murdered for their faith. Paul was a persecutor of the church. And the blood of Jesus is powerful enough that it could wash away even this humongous sin. I want you to understand that this is one of the biggest sins you can commit to lay a hand on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as Jesus said to, to Saul before he became Paul, when you hit the church, you hit Jesus. I want you to all look at me today and I want you to understand. Even in our lives, we can hit the church. When we are believers and we go out there and we're doing stuff that we shouldn't be doing, we are hitting the church. And let me tell you something, Jesus comes to us and says, why are you persecuting me? But here's the thing, even that, even that massive sin can be washed away by the power of the blood of Jesus. And everything that I'm going to say to you today, I want you to listen to it with this in mind that says everything that we do, every sin can be washed away by the blood of Jesus. And this is... The grace of God. The most incredible blessing that you have is the grace of Almighty God that is upon your life. But the grace comes with an unexpected blessing. 
And we read about this blessing, and I want to take you back to Romans 12, 3, but this time from the Passion Translation. And it says this, God has given me grace to speak a warning about pride. So God has given me the grace to speak a warning about pride. Now Paul, I mean, when he was Saul, think about all the pride he had. He thought he could kill people because he believed that they believed wrong. You cannot kill anyone, whether verbally, physically, emotionally, or whatever, just because you believe that what they believe is wrong. And Paul had done this, and God's grace was on Paul, and it was so great that it allowed him to speak about pride. The thing that he would have suffered was the most. And you know when when you tell people about Jesus, I want all of you to look at me now, because I think one or two people have a hang up about this. When you tell people about Jesus, and they know about your past, you know what they start saying, don't you? They start saying, who are you to speak? And when Paul was preaching to the Jews, they knew about his past. They knew who this Paul was. They knew that he was Saul who was taking out the church. And, and, and I can hear some of them saying to him, yes, but Paul, who are you to speak? I knew Saul. And Paul replied, I speak to you by the grace God has given me. God has given me the grace to be able to preach his gospel message. Yes, I was the chief persecutor of the church, but God has given me the grace, and the grace is so massive and it's so big on my life that God has graced me to be able to speak the gospel anyway. And so this grace is a grace that comes by faith, and it gives us the right to become the witnesses of what Jesus did, what, what, what the blood of Jesus does for us through the cross, what Calvary means to us, and we have the right to witness to other people about what Jesus has done in our lives. And the message puts it this way, that same, that same passage from Romans 12, 3. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Now, I actually underlined that in my notes, especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. And, and now, this is what's be, what becomes important today. So you have been washed by the blood of Jesus. You have the right to speak out and to be a witness of what Jesus has done in your life. But understand this. With this right comes responsibility. And I want you to think about the time that we're living in. I want you to think about what's going on in the world today. We live, we live in a day and an age where people get asked the question, what is a woman, and they can't answer it. And I'm not talking about uneducated, ignorant people. I'm talking about some of the most educated, some of the most powerful people in the world cannot answer the question, what is a woman? These beliefs or these ideologies are coming out from the enemy, and the enemy has an agenda. And if the church doesn't wake up to the, to the agenda that the enemy has, then life for the church will become harder. It will become harder to be a Christian. It will become harder to live out your faith. In the book of the Bible, there's a book called Esther. And you know what I believe is that God is looking for an Esther-type church to be raised up and to go out and to touch the world with the love of God and to save their people from impending disaster. If you know about the book of Esther, she grew up in a time when her people were in exile and there was a plan afoot to wipe her nation out. And God placed her in the position to be able to turn the whole situation around so that the enemies of God would fail in their desire to want to destroy what the Lord had done. 
Esther was able to do what she did because as we will look now over the next week or two, she was able to get, it, get that stuff right because she became the queen to the king. But Esther only comes into the picture because the previous leader had failed. And this, what I'm talking to you about today, a few weeks ago we were at a conference and we spoke to you about um, Pastor Sester's daughter, Sarah, and the testimony that they had of their daughter who was resurrected from the dead. And she spoke about Esther and how it relates to us today. And she gave this thought about Queen Vashti. Vashti was called by the king. And before I move on with that, I want to say every single one of us has been called by the king. We've been called to go into the presence of God by our king. And in Esther chapter 1 verse 12, it says, when the king called for Vashti, it says, but Queen Vashti refused to come, refused the summons delivered by, by the eunuchs. The king lost his temper, seething with anger over her insolence. When Vashti was called, she refused to come. She had this idea, who are you to call me? Who are you to speak to me? Who are you to tell me to come into your presence? All of your servants there are drunk. You know, at the end of the day, this is beneath me. I am a dignified woman. I am a feminist. Uh, who, who, who does this king think he is? I'm all for women's rights. I'm not going. I'm not there just so that you can brag to all of your drunk friends about my beauty. A woman is more than just a piece of meat. You know, all of these things. But you know what the result was? Vashti lost her calling. By refusing to come, she totally and utterly humiliated the king. She lost her calling and she forgot what she had been called for. She forgot who she had been called for. She had been called for the king. The call had come directly from the king. She forgot her place. When God calls you, do you forget your place? Her relationship to the king, it was this relationship that she had with the king of being his wife that made her queen. The title she carried, she carried because of her relationship to the king. In terms of her title, Queen Vashti, Everything she had came from her relationship with the king. And I want to tell you today, Christian, that everything that you have, title of being part of the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, comes to you because of your relationship with the king through the Lord Jesus Christ. You have nothing else without that. So her relationship to the king made her queen. And today... We're living in a world where people, and I'm talking about people in the church, are forgetting about their creator. When the church forgets their creator, there's a huge problem. When the church neglects to operate after the word, taking into account the Bible, there's a problem. When the church begins to make decisions and we're not basing it on the Word of God, there's a problem. And Vashti, when she refused to come, was probably suffering from a dose of arrogance. She had entered selfie world. You know what many people enter on their social media. And I'm asking you today, and this was something that Sarah asked. If people look at your social media today, if you're on social media, what do they find? You know that, uh, and she, she mentioned this, I didn't know this, 
But apparently selfie photos are one of the leading causes of death in the world today. People actually try and take these weird and wonderful selfie photos, sometimes in dangerous positions, and people end up dying taking a selfie. I, I couldn't believe it. And then I went and checked it up, and it's true. There's a lot of people, they'll hang off a bridge, or they'll do all sorts of weird stuff in order to take a fantastic selfie, only to get killed like seconds later. What kind of a world do we live in that people would put their lives at risk in order to take a selfie? Why do people take selfies like this? Because they're thinking about themselves. And Vashti was in a selfie moment. She only thought about herself. She didn't think about all the other women of the nation. She didn't think about how her actions were going to affect the husbands within the nation. She didn't, she didn't think about how a destruction of the family was going to affect the strength of the nation of which she was queen. Following Jesus is about dying to ourselves constantly. Dying to our desires constantly. The king who made her queen had called her and she refused. Jesus says, my church has disobeyed me. And what did we learn from Vashti? Is that when we disobey God's call, then God calls someone else. I want you really to let that sink in for a second. When we refuse the call of God, God calls someone else. And in Esther chapter 1 verse 15 to 17, what shall we do to Queen Vashti? According to the law, because she did not obey the command of the, of the king, brought here to by, by the eunuchs. And the men answered before the king and the princes, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in the provinces of King Artaxerxes. For the queen's behavior will become known to all the women, and they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they report King Artaxerxes commanded Queen Vashti be brought in before him, and she did not come. Now, in the book of Revelation, we see that Jesus is also speaking to his church. He's also calling to his church. And we see in Revelation 1, 4 to 6, it says, John, the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, I want you to think about what it says there. In verse 6 it says, And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. So our calling is to be kings and priests. And what does a priest do? A priest allows others to enter into the presence of God. We are called to be priests. We are called to be people that are allowing others to be ushered into the presence of God. So we have two purposes. We have the purposes as priests. And what does the priest do? The priest goes before the king and petitions to the king so that others can come into the presence of Almighty God. And kings are yet to reign on the earth. I don't know if you realize this, but the Greek word for church is ecclesia. And the ecclesia is like a parliament from ancient Greece. And Jesus chose that word for the church. In other words, when the church comes together, we come together, we're united. We are supposed to legislate in the spiritual realm what's supposed to happen in the natural realm here on earth. And that affects the future. And when the church stops legislating, then the enemy can come in and take over. I want you to understand directly. 
the mess that the world is in is laid firmly at the foot of the church when you look at what Jesus taught about who the church is. When you look at what Jesus taught about who you are. Vasi was a priest and she was a ruler. She was like the head wife of the nation and she lost both of her titles. In Esther chapter 2 verse 7 and Mordecai who had brought up Adassa, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful and when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Esther was raised in the manner of discipleship. And discipleship is always related to your purpose. You know, when we talk about making disciples, it's always relating to purpose. And it relates, discipleship relates to every area of a person's life. It relates to their fellowship with God. It relates to their family. It relates to their finances. It relates to them having followers in the kingdom of God. And I want you to know with purpose that blood was shed from your Savior's feet. His blood was shed from His feet so that you can walk in the perfect purpose of God. And I want to tell you that in life you've got a choice. You can choose the path that God has set before you or you can choose another path. But when you choose another path, you end up in dark places. It's very sad when someone has the word and they end up in dark places. And I want to speak to you today about which path are you taking. Are you taking the Lord's path for your life or are you taking your own path? You see, the Lord has set the blood of Jesus and particularly the blood that was shed from His feet so that we can get onto the path that God has set for us. By His blood, Jesus has established our steps in the purpose of God. Do you know that we can also pray and apply this over people that we love, that they would be established in the purposes of God. And what this is all about is about being established and growing in the vision. The vision that God has. The vision that God has for His church. The vision that God has for our lives. And when, when we're operating in the vision of God, then what, what ends up happening is that the blood of Jesus actually begins to bring judgment on all of the evil spirits that are working against us and working against the purpose of God in our lives. This morning I was reading in the book of Acts where the apostle Paul <coughs> was collecting some sticks. He got bitten by a snake. I actually put up a post about it. And it was a poisonous snake and everyone was watching Paul. They're watching him, eh? And they're waiting for him to swell up and die. And all Paul did, he took the snake, he shook it and he threw it into the fire. And after a while they realized Paul's not going to die. So they wanted to worship him as a god. And you know why Paul didn't die? Paul didn't die because God's plan for him was to stand before Caesar in Rome. God's plan for him was that he was going to be a witness to the gospel in the, or before the throne of the most powerful man in the world at that time, the emperor of Rome. And I want to tell you as, you, as you're sitting here today, if God has a plan for you to have an audience before the most powerful man in the world today, and a poisonous snake bites you, but you are in the will of God, you're doing what God has called you to do, you will supernaturally survive that snake bite. If God has purposed you to go somewhere, if God has set your destiny before you, this is why the training we do is called destiny training. It, it teaches you how to get to your destiny. If God has set your destiny before you, the most poisonous snake in the world can come and bite you. But you will not die.
As Jesus hung on the cross, he had to support himself on that nail in his feet so that he could straighten his body to breathe because his, his chest would have been severely compressed as he hung himself down. But the moment he put the, the, the effort on, on that nail, imagine the nails in your foot, you're pulling all your effort onto that nail and all of your weight, imagine how painful that is. And the enemy was aware that Jesus was the one who would crush his head. From Genesis chapter 3, when the fall happened, God said to the serpent, the, the, the woman's offspring will crush your head. And so when the enemy had the foot of Jesus on the cross, he thought that the crushing would pass. But he was unaware of something, and this is what I want you to hear today. He was completely unaware that everything that Jesus would suffer on the cross and the blood that he would shed was a divine strategy. It was a divine strategy of God for conclusively crushing all the skimming of the enemy. And Jesus decided to endure all the suffering so that we could become overcomers and walk on the right path. In Mark chapter 4 verse 26, it says, Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the path. Every time we have an encounter, we teach your feet represent purpose because on your feet, it's using your feet, you use them to go somewhere. With the blood of Jesus. Maybe you're worried that you're going in the wrong direction. But if you apply this blood that was shed from Jesus' feet, the Lord will supernaturally ensure that you're on His path, that you're living for His purpose. And what does the Bible say about your purpose? It says that you have been set aside for the most important purpose, the most important mission of all. And in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 it says, For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. You are the masterpiece of God. God has His fingerprints all over you. And when you gave your life to Jesus, He has created you anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So that we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. When did He plan those things? At the creation of the world. The good things that God wants you to do, He planned them for you at the creation of the world. And, and Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says, now listen to this, these incredible words. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. You know that God knew you before you were conceived. When someone tells you that you're no more than a chimpanzee because of evolution, God says, no, that's not true. Before I formed you in your womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God knew you before you were even conceived. And I want to tell every single one of you, He's appointed you as a prophet to the nations. This is why God's not, God's saying to you, look, Please stop running to people who call themselves prophets because I appointed you to be a prophet to nations. I want you to look at me now. I want to ask you, what are you going to do with that call? I want to ask you, for those of you who can relate to Queen Vashti, how long are you going to continue to ignore the call of your king? You're in the position you're in because of your king. And I want you to think about that today. I really want you to think about that today. And I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to picture your life. And I want you to think about the calling that God has placed on your life. There's a world out there that needs to hear from you. We're going to continue this word next week. There's a world out there that's living in a state of disaster.
But before you can go out there into the world and speak to people about Jesus, you've got to know Jesus yourself. And right now I'm going to ask you all just to stand where you are. And I'm going to ask you right now to picture where you stand with the Lord. What is it that you need to be saved? In Romans 10, 8 and 9, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This morning the word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. If you just speak it, the word is there. It's in your heart. God has placed it there right now in this service. And I also want to tell you that today, your eternal destiny is at stake. Your eternity is at stake. And the Lord is calling to you today. He's saying, I want you to come to me. Maybe you've never known Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But as you've been hearing about your purpose today, the Lord has been speaking to you. It's been the Holy Spirit. And He's saying to you, I want you to surrender to me today. And He's saying the word is near you and it's in your heart. And what is that word? That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. If you don't know where you'll stand with God when you face Him in judgment, if you die, the Lord is calling you forward. If you used to have a, a very strong relationship with God, but you've lost touch with Him, the Lord is calling you forward. This place in front of this stage today is an altar. And at this altar, your eternal destiny is at stake. And maybe one or two of you are saying, no, I'll just wait. I'll pray at home. I'll do it a little bit later. No, you need to come to this place right now because what the Lord is saying to you is that um, this altar sanctifies everything and you must not think that you're going to have a more effective time later because now is the time. Now is the time that the Lord has placed the altar before you. Now is the time that the Lord is saying, I want you to set your heart right with me. Now is the time. I want you to set your feet on the purpose that I've created for you. And if you're needing to recommit your life to Jesus because you haven't been living for His purpose, then now is the time to come forward. And what I want to say to you today is that when you come forward, you're saying, Lord, this is the time. Lord, I want to commit to you right now. Lord, I want to submit my life completely to you right now. Lord, I can't wait until later. You're saying, Lord, I don't know if I'm going to make it. So I'm coming now, Lord. Lord, I want to commit to you now because I don't want to live eternity far from you. I don't, I don't want to know another day without you. I want to choose to live with you from this day on. I want to choose to live with you from this day on so that when death comes knocking at my door, I will be ready for it because my death won't affect me because I'll know that I've been living with you and that I'll live with you for eternity. And that even when I experience those words from Psalm 23, that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Lord, I want to know it's going to be the valley of the shadow of death because you're going to be going there with me. I don't want to spend another day away from you, Lord. Lord, now is the time. And so I'm going to invite you to come forward right now. If you need to give your life to Jesus, if you need to recommit your life to Jesus, maybe you've lost touch with Him. Or maybe you're just needing to recommit your life to Jesus because you need to recommit to His purpose. You've been making your own decisions. You've been doing your own things. And the Lord is calling you home today. Then I'm going to offer of, uh, invite you to come forward right now and if you're at one of the sites you come forward there at the site too with everyone standing just come forward right now and we're just going to wait for you just come come right now
I just feel that someone that is here today, or maybe at one of the sites, you feel that you're too far gone. You feel that God can never come back to you. I don't know who you are. But the Lord is calling you because the blood of Jesus is far more powerful than anything you could have done wrong. If you could save Saul and turn him into the Apostle Paul, doing it for you is nothing. You're never too bad for the love of God. You're never too bad for the blood of Jesus. If you come forward and you repent, and by coming forward and repenting, you're declaring, Lord, I want my life to change. The Lord will give you the faith to know that He has washed you clean with the blood of Jesus. He has washed you clean and, and He will give you this assurance inside of your heart that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That He has justified you. That He sees you as if you have never sinned. But you need to surrender to Him first. And so coming forward is an act of surrender. It's an act of surrender. And so I'm just calling again because there's at least one person the Lord has been speaking to. You're thinking, I'm not going to go forward. This is what you're thinking in your mind right now. You're thinking, I'm not going to go forward. But the Lord is saying, I will not force you. But I am calling you. And the best thing you could ever do for yourself right now is to go forward. As I said earlier, this place in front of the stage is an altar that sanctifies everything. That sets everything aside for the ever-living God. And so the Lord is calling you right now. That person or those people that I spoke to, and I believe it was God speaking to you, just come forward right now. wants me to say that there's someone here you feel you're too far gone I don't know who you are you've been feeling this and the Lord has spoken to you today and the enemy doesn't want you to come forward we're going to move on but I'm just going to say if that is you just come forward and I just also feel there's someone and you're feeling, you know, if I surrender my life to Jesus, then I'm going to lose my life. And Jesus said, what good is it for you if you hold on to your life and lose your soul? The life He wants to give you is far greater than um, the life you want to hold on to. And so just come forward right now. We're going to start praying. One of those two people, there's at least two people. But we're going to move on. But you need to come forward. You know who you are. The Lord is speaking to you. You can, you might even be sort of shaking slightly. And it's not the cult. The Lord is speaking to you. I want to encourage you to come forward. Because the Spirit is going to touch you right now. So just come forward if that is you. But those of you that are standing in the front here. Put your right hand on your heart. And I want you to picture Jesus. I want you to see him standing before you and I want you to remember that he died on the cross for you. He 
died on the cross for you. And the Bible says that this Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He died for you. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. And this same Jesus who died for you 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary, His work stands once and for all. The blood is as powerful today as it ever was. And the blood that He shed was the price that He paid that will wash your sins away. I want you to picture Him. should repeat after me say Lord Jesus today I recognize that I'm a sinner I repent of everything I've done wrong I renounce my life of sin and I accept your sacrifice and I know it was the price you paid for my redemption and today Lord I ask that the blood of your wounded body would wash me of all my rebellion and all my sin I ask that you'd set me free from any sickness and pain. And I accept that my debt has been paid. There is no outstanding balance. Because you paid it all for me on the cross of Calvary. I accept that by your blood I'm justified. And so you see me as I've never sinned. I thank you Jesus. That you see me as I've never sinned. And by your blood I'm sanctified. And you have chosen me to serve you. And Lord, I'm willing to serve you. So today I open the door of my heart. And I invite you to come in as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me and for giving me eternal life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I love this about God, that He makes so much of Himself available to us by teaching us certain principles. This is life orientation. (laughs) Guess what? We will go on to do incredible things for God. Wow. I think I said that right. (laughs) We don't play around here. God has a purpose for each and every single generation. Our country needs change. This generation needs an encounter with God. You can't live on your parents' encounter with God. You have to have your own encounter with God. Jesus says, hey, you did not choose me. I chose you. That's real. And he equips us as well. He's not going to leave us on our own. The biggest problem is not the problem, it's the lack of people willing to be the solution. When you have the mindset for other people, God takes care of you. When you build God's house, God builds your house. And in fact, when God builds your house, it's always better than you could have ever built it yourself. Mm. That's why we go preach the gospel. Or raise up a Joshua type of generation. We can get a generation to God that this country will change. But listen to me, a country doesn't change outside in. It is always inside out. It starts with the heart because everything you do is because of how you think and what you think is acceptable and what you think you can get away with. And so if the heart doesn't change, you can act for a long time on the outside. Somewhere you will be caught that inside is a snake and not the love of God. 